God loves us and made us. And he made a way for us to be close to him. He's so, so good.
You know, singing another song or something. I don't know. You never do. Look at all these people. How marvelous. Good to see all y'all today. Man, it's been a long week. Everybody else having a long week? I thought when summer comes, it gets easier. I guess it's not quite here yet. Man, we, um, we, uh, my wife and I went last week to visit Joan, um, Joan and Bill, uh, Johnson and uh, Joan is a, an amazing woman and, and she's sitting in the bed there and we're telling her she's faking it because she looked fine and um, we had a nice visit with her and she's telling us stories and she just she's entertaining us and uh, but when we were done we prayed and we left and uh, a couple days later we find out that she's been taken into palliative care and now she's hardly talking and and uh, they've taken her off her medications. And so uh, they're just, uh, I guess they're waiting for her to go and see Jesus. So that's all right. That's all right. We're going to miss her. We're going to miss her smiling face. And, uh, and uh, man, I pray for her family. I pray for Bill. 
you know, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a tough one. And and you see you see the the the, the curse of staying together so long. You know, man, we should probably end it now so it's, it doesn't get weirder. I can't imagine um, all the years Bill and Joan have been together, and now they're going to be separated. And so for Bill, it's going to be tough. We need to pray for Bill. We need to be there for him. And uh, it'll be good. But it'll be a, it'll be a, a wonderful, wonderful celebration of, of life when, uh, when we have a, a funeral for Joan. And uh, she just talks about it. She's talking to all the nurses and stuff. She says, oh, I think my angel's coming today to get me. And uh, <laughs> too funny. Anyway, I'm just, I'm excited for her. And... Uh, I'm sad for Bill and the family and pray you, that you all pray for them and, and keep them in your prayers. I know there's other people that are, are hurting and that are, are in a bad way. And um, is this your baby, Ashley? Oh, okay. I wanted to congratulate you on having a baby. Um, we should show you this. is uh, it, The baby kept looking at me and it was freaking me out. <laughs> Chucky. Um, it's okay, I've turned it on its belly now. <laughs> okay. Is that weird? I got this thing about babies, man. Yeah. I just don't want to have any more, that's all. Man, God is so good, and, and uh, our prayer is for everybody that's hurting. You know, Jesus is there for you. He wants to help you through those troubles. Our troubles aren't going to go away. You know, the, the, the life... Is this life that we live right here, there's sin everywhere, there's death everywhere. Our troubles are going to be with us as long as sin is here. And uh, But Jesus Christ is going to help us through those times. I, I, I'm not in any way one of these prosperity guys off of TV. Uh, what they're doing is terribly harmful, telling people that God wants to make you wealthy and healthy. That's a, a lie from hell. And, and I don't want to make it so miserable that you all never come back again either. But, but there's somewhere in between there's a balance. And, and, and Christ wants to help us through this life into the next. And the next life, man, when, when Jesus returns, we're going to be made perfect. There's going to be no more sin, no more sorrow, no more death, no more disease. And uh, we're just going to live in a perfect world then. We, we can't even imagine. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, things were better than they are now. But it was nowhere near perfect. I mean, it hasn't been perfect for 6,000 years. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what perfection's like. Wow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you, Lord, for the people who have come out here. Uh, and no one's used to a half an hour earlier, but... I'm so grateful that people are here and we're here to, we're here to see you. We're here to talk to you and, and we're just so thrilled that you've, you've given us this opportunity to talk to you. I'm glad, Lord Jesus, that you listen to us. We could say, wow, there's, there's billions of people in this world. How can you possibly have time to hear us? But you do. You have time because you're God. You're God. Thank you so much. And Father, we pray for Joan, and we pray you'd give her peace, you'd give her comfort, Lord. Thank you so much for the joy that she has. Thank you for her family, Lord. We pray your blessing upon them as they go through this period of time. Oh, God, we pray in Jesus' name, give them peace. Let them feel your joy during this time. Lord, we pray for Bill. Give him strength, give him courage. I don't know what it's like, but you do. And I pray in Jesus' name, you just touch his heart. May this be a time when he grows stronger in his faith in you. And Father, thank you so much for all Joan's children and her family and her sister. I pray in Jesus' name, you just bless them all. The whole, the whole bunch of them, Lord. May they, may they enjoy, may they enjoy this time together as they, as they remember things of childhood, and the, the, all the memories, all the memories that they have, Lord. Just bless them, and, and may this be a great time of rejoicing as Joan receives her crown. Thank you so much.
Father, we pray for everybody else that's suffering from whether it's financial or spiritual or physical. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Touch them. Give them peace. Give them comfort. Heal them, Lord. Heal their situation. We know that you're a God who heals, so we ask for healing. If that's your will, that'd be wonderful. If it's not your will, we still know you can do it, so we're asking anyway. Thank you so much. Father, be with us this morning as we look into your word. Speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And God, I pray for Georgina. I thank you so much for this town we live in. What a great place. What wonderful people we're surrounded by. It's, it's a wonderful place. And Lord, I pray for all of the churches in Georgina right now. They're all meeting, getting together. I pray that you would strengthen them and encourage them. I pray, God, that they would hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Whew, I forgot you all were here while I was praying. And I just realized I better get to her. Um, we've been studying John. So if you're if you're a first-time visitor here, by the way, if you got a bag, if you're a visitor and you got a welcome bag, make sure you fill in that card that's in there. Because um, not only do you get a Tim Hortons card worth $100, <laughs> okay, well, you'll get a coffee anyway, but, but not only will you get a, a Tim Hortons card for handing that in, but also I'd like to keep in touch with you and I'll just put you on our email list so that you can receive our monthly email and see what's going on and just keep you up to date. So we've been studying through John, we're at John chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. And uh, we've, we've looked at this already. I'm just going to look at it from a different angle this morning. So uh, let's read this here, starting in verse 1. Now, when Jesus learned that the religious leaders had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself wasn't doing it, it was his disciples, he left Judea and he departed for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So on his way to Galilee, he has to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar. This is where Jacob and, and Joseph are buried. This is where, where Jacob's family comes from. And, and, and Jacob uh, dug a well there and uh, to feed his animals and all of his uh, servants and everything. Jacob's well was there. And uh, so Jesus, wearied from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It's about the sixth hour. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. So his disciples had gone into the city to get some snacks, probably Lay's chips and stuff. And um, while they're doing that, the Samaritan, he asked the Samaritan woman, could you get me a drink? She's drawing water from the well. And, and the woman... <laughs> The woman says to him, she says, how is it that you, a Jew, would ask me for a drink? A woman from Samaria. Two problems there. In this culture, at this time, a woman is nobody. And a man should not be talking to a woman. That's a funny thing because when I do, when I do like premarital counseling, when we get together and we talk about, about getting married, I have to say to people, and, and this is, for me, it's weird, because when I was a kid in high school, I didn't have a whole bunch of friends that were girls. Like, I, I didn't have a best friend who was a girl. That was weird to me. I don't know why. But, but I know that, you know, when I was 15 and I got a girlfriend, she wouldn't let me talk to girls. <laughs> it's smart, though. It's smart that a guy doesn't have friends that are girls when you got a girlfriend because there's always going to be that jealousy that, 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 that it's always, it seems to, you know what, if, if you're a woman and you ask me for a ride home and I was by myself in my car, I wouldn't give you a ride. And it's not because I don't like women, because actually I do, I'm a bit of a lesbian. <laughs> Hi, morning, welcome to Hope for Today Fellowship. <laughs> We'll fix that later. Don't worry about it. But the, the deal is, like, I don't want a woman in my car, not because I don't trust myself, not because I don't trust her. That could be part of it. But the biggest thing is, what if someone saw me and told my wife, you know, oh, I saw Brian driving around town with this woman in his car. Even if she, she knows I'm faithful, right? 
<laughs> what do you mean we'll talk about that later? <laughs> we, the, the, the point is, the, the point is, there's always going to be that kind of, the, the, you don't want to plant seeds of jealousy in each other. You, you want to be sure. And, and even, you, you might be giving that woman the wrong idea. It's, it's, there's, it's, it, it's, there's something to that. But in this culture here, in the Jewish culture, in, in the time of Christ, it was just it was just inappropriate all the time. In, in fact, um, even if you're sitting and talking about Jesus, which you wouldn't do, you wouldn't be talking about Torah together because um, a woman doesn't talk to a man. So even if it was a religious thing, you couldn't talk to the woman. Women didn't go to school. They didn't go to, to, to shul. They didn't go to uh, learn about Torah. It's just the way it was. Very, very chauvinistic kind of uh, attitude. But that wasn't, that's not a Bible thing. Now that's what's important here. That's not a Bible thing. That's, that's a culture, cultural thing from this period of time in that place. Okay? So don't ever blame this on, the Bible is not written by a bunch of chauvinistic pigs. Uh, and I've tried to tell you all, if you look at the Bible... And, and take it literally from cover to cover, a woman is always special, not a man. A woman is always special. Men were created out of the dirt. Men are just dirt. A woman was created out of the rib. She's special. And so I, I don't want you to get weirded out or upset about that in case you're a feminazi of sorts. But we're not chauvinistic here. We're not. The Bible is not a chauvinistic book. But in this culture at this time, so that... There, this woman's weirded out. She's going like, you want me to get you a drink. You're talking to me. You're a Jew. Jews don't like Samaritans because they're only half Jews. I'm a Samaritan and I'm a woman. Why are you talking to me? Jesus answered her and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying this to you, give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. If you had known that I am God. And that I'm going to give you a living water. A water that never ends. That just keeps, you'll never thirst again. If you knew, if you knew these things, you wouldn't question me. And the woman said to him, and she's focused on the physical, not the spiritual. And she says to him, sir, you have nothing to draw the water with. And the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Remember, this is Jacob's well. He gave us the well and he drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of me, whoever drinks of this living water will never thirst again. The water that I will give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to her, him, she, she's still focused on the physical, and she says, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty, and I don't have to come and get more water later. And so Jesus has to point out to her that he's talking about spiritual stuff. So he says, Go call your husband. Go call your husband. It's like it seems like he's changing the topic, but he's not. Go get your husband. Well, well. Um, I can't because I don't have a husband. This is her answer. I don't know why I didn't put these verses in. I don't have a husband. And, 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 and he says, you're right. You're right in saying you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. And the dude you're with right now, you're just cohabitating. He pointed out to her her sin. And now she sees the need for living water. Not just Jacob's water, but living water. She needs salvation. The reason I want to go back to this passage, we did it last week, but I wanted to go back because I wanted to make a comparison between what we saw in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus and, and, and what we're seeing now in John chapter 4 with the woman of Samaria. Samaria. So we're going, to look at this, we're going to look at this situation here. Um, the, the woman, they're, they're both opposite. The man and the woman are both opposite in everything. But the passage is showing us that everyone... Everywhere needs Jesus. Everyone, everywhere needs Jesus. 
There's no one who does it. Oh, oh, those people there, they're not worthy. Sure they are. Sure they are. When we read the Bible, when we read this, all this cultural stuff here, like, I was thinking this morning while I'm reading, I'm thinking, if, if, um, we live in our culture and we're reading about all this stuff that happened 2,000 years ago in the Middle East. And so it's like, it's totally different. I mean, they're drawing water from a well. Some people here might remember that. I mean, some people that, maybe George. <laughs> That's probably not because you're from Toronto. But, but some people might have had a well and, and they might have been drawing from the well. But, but for most of us, this is foreign, man. We turn and tap. We just do the tap thing. We're looking at a different culture. So when, when, when my, my family, uh, we went to Mexico on a mission trip, and, and, and we went into that culture, and, and it was very different than the culture that we live in. Everything was different. The language was different. The only, the only Spanish I know is, hey, where's the banjo? And, and that's not banjo. I wasn't asking for a banjo. But, but, but their language was all different. And, and, and we had to try and communicate. I don't speak any Spanish at all. And, and we were, my, my daughter took some Spanish in school, which came in handy. But, but even the food, the food, I expected it to be like Taco Bell. I love Taco Bell. It was nothing like Taco Bell. I was very, very discouraged. Talk about I just made myself hungry. Everything was different. Oh, you know what, was really, what really stood out to us? Here in our culture, this is funny, because in our culture, you look at the way people dress. I mean, the, the fashions. I don't understand fashion, obviously. But, but, but people, you know, they, when I was in high school, my jeans were all ripped. They were, I started that. I started that fad. But, and then, and then when I started dating, my wife didn't like that so much because her mom wasn't impressed. My girlfriend, sorry. And so I, I, I sewed patches on all of the holes. They still didn't like it. But today, we dress in clothes that almost look dirty. You go to Mexico, where it's all dirt roads, there's, there's dirt everywhere. And they're wearing white clothes, and their clothes are always clean. We're going like, how do they do that? Some, but being, being immersed in another culture is so cool, because you learn so much. But despite the differences, uh, one thing is always the same. It doesn't matter where you go in the world, one thing is always the same, and that's the people's need for Jesus Christ. We're all sinners, no matter where I go, our hearts are deceitfully wicked. We're all sinners. In Mexico in 2020, there was more than 18,000 murders. In the United States of America in 2020, there was more than 18,000 murders. There's no difference. Sin is the same everywhere. Don't, don't think you're going to go somewhere and there's going to be no sin. That doesn't happen on earth. There's, there's sin everywhere, and everybody needs Jesus the same. It doesn't matter what culture we're in. It doesn't matter what people we're talking to. We all are sinners. So in John chapter 4, salvation is spreading beyond the people of Israel. So Jesus, in John chapter 3, he's talking to this, this religious leader, Nicodemus, a Jewish religious rabbi. And, and he's talking to him about his need for, to, to be rescued from sin. And then in John chapter 4, he's talking to this Samaritan woman about her need to be rescued from sin. It's no different. It's no different. But these are two different people from two different cultures. What they do have in common is they need the same Jesus. And so this whole story is so bizarre when you look at it. So you're looking at two different people with two different needs. One of them, look at the first, the first thing that they have in, in opposite. Can you say you have an opposite? The first thing that they hold in opposition to each other is their gender. Their gender. This rabbi in John chapter, the disciples have no problem with Jesus talking to the rabbi because it makes sense. 
It makes sense. He's a religious leader. He should know the Torah. The Torah is all about Jesus coming, the, the, the Messiah coming to earth. And so there's something very much in common with these religious leaders. And, and, and so the disciples don't have, and he's talking to a man. They don't have a problem with that. And then, and then he talks to this woman and they're going like, what's he doing talking to a woman? And yet they both have, even though they're different genders, they both have the same need. It doesn't matter what gender you are. We all need Jesus Christ. You look at the, the next thing that they have in opposite, and that's their status. Nicodemus was a respected leader of the, of the society. He was, he was the religious leader. He was judged as a morally upright person. His status in society was totally different than this woman who had been married five times and was now living with somebody. Totally different. And yet the same need. They both need Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus was, uh, was uh, mocked a lot of times for, by the religious leaders of his day. Because of who he hung with. And, 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 you know, Jesus hung with the religious leader, the rabbi. That wasn't a problem. But when he's hanging with sinners and tax collectors, they get all freaked out. They get all upset. Look at this passage in Mark chapter 2, verses 15 to 16. And as Jesus reclined at the table in his, this is in Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the religious Jewish leaders, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, he said to his disciples, why does he eat with the tax collectors and sinners? The, the, the religious leaders were, were kind of, they were upset about that. Why, why would Jesus eat with sinners and tax collectors? Because the rabbis wouldn't. These, these Pharisees, these religious leaders of the, of the Jewish people, they wouldn't do that. Because they would be afraid of becoming unclean. If you, if you go to an Orthodox Jewish home and you're a Gentile, if you're a non-Jew, they have a whole other set of dishes for you to eat off. You can't eat off their dishes. They might become unclean if you eat off of their dishes. <clears throat> How does that make you feel? I'd say no thanks. I don't want to eat with you. <laughs> if I'm not worthy of eating off of your plate, now no one's going to invite me over. It's sad when we do that to people. You know what? Did you see just a couple years ago, Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland, he's a prosperity preacher on TV. And he was on the news because he was taking his personal jet someplace. And, and the news lady is asking him, why don't you fly on public transit? And he says, because people on public transit are full of demons. He was being like a Pharisee. He was saying, I'm pure and they're not. And if I hang out with them, I'll become unpure. And you know what? That was evil what he said. He became unpure just by saying that. That's not what Jesus would have done. Jesus loves Air Canada. <laughs> Number three, their nationality. So Nicodemus was a Jew. The woman was a Samaritan. And Jews and Samaritans never got along. And the reason for that is that the, the, the Samaritans, they're a bunch of Jews who got together with the Assyrians and they intermarried. And so they became blended. And Orthodox Jews won't accept that. You have to be a pure Jew. It's the same with, if you look at the temple, um, the temple that used to be in Jerusalem, there was a place for the Jews. And then there was a place outside of that where Gentiles who had been converted to Judaism could go to pray. They weren't allowed in where the Jews were allowed in. Because, see, they're not pure. 
Isn't that sad? That's a sad situation. Can you imagine if we said, you know, all you people that have been born again for 10 years, you all can sit on this side. But all the people that are just your brand new Christians, you, you, you all got to sit on that side. We're going to separate you. Because we love to separate people, don't we? <laughs> Man, that is so bad. Jesus doesn't care. He goes and visits the religious leader. He goes and visits the woman who's, who's uh, involved in all kinds of um, outright sin. I'm sure, those, I'm sure those Jewish leaders were involved in sin too, but theirs was hidden. This lady happened to have her sin uh, out, uh, out in the open. But Jesus says he reaches out to both of them in, the, in their desperate need and says, you know what? You need living water. You need Jesus Christ. You need to be born again. That's what he told the, the Jewish leader. Everyone needs Jesus. Everyone, everywhere. The moral can't be saved by their morality. You can't say I'm a good person, therefore I am going to heaven. You can't say that. People say that all the time. You ask someone, are you going to heaven when you die? Of course I am. I'm a good person. That's wonderful. I'm glad you're a good person. I like good people. I really do. Don't you like good people? It's fantastic that you're good people. That wasn't the question. When you die, you're going to get to heaven. Well, no, you're not because you're a sinner. We're all sinners. All have sinned. The Bible says so. We're all sinners. But I've never stole anything. I've never killed anybody. No, but are you following Jesus Christ? No. Well, then you're rejecting him. That's a sin. How dare you reject Jesus Christ? We're all sinners. Doesn't matter how good you are. That's not the question. That's not what Jesus says. The only way into heaven is through Jesus Christ. If you're not following him, you're not getting into heaven. That, that bothers people. You can see on faces. You can see how much that bothers people. But I'm a good person. Let me ask you this. Because this is how much we twist. We twist this whole thing around. Okay? Has anybody here ever stolen anything? Put your hand up. A couple of us. Okay? Now, a couple of us are lying. I know for a fact. Listen, this is I, I was asking someone this, and they said, I've never stole anything. And I said, did you ever, because I know she had a sister. I said, did you ever take your sister's sweater without asking? And she says, well, of course, sisters do that. I said, you know, take something that doesn't belong to you without asking is stealing. No, it's not. Oh, now we're going to justify our sin, right? Anybody here ever, um, what? Did someone say something? Oh. Anybody here ever lie? Put your hand up. See, now some people didn't put their hands up because they don't lie. They just tell white lies. <laughs> and technically, when I lie, I'm not really lying because technically, this is the big word, right? The Bible says you shouldn't lie. It doesn't say which lies you shouldn't do. It says you shouldn't lie. So you can't say, well, the lies that I tell, they were to protect people. I mean, there's no differentiation in the Bible. So if you're a thief and you're a liar, those are only two of the Ten Commandments. How good of a person are you, really? Anybody here? Any? Let's do it this way. Any man here ever look at a woman with lust in his heart? No. Did you hear the question, guys? <laughs> what? What? Okay, it works the other way, too. Watch. Any women here ever watch soap operas? <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Lust in their heart. So, Jesus says if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. You've committed adultery. So now you're a thief. You're a liar and you're an adulterer. Should we keep going? Sure. sure, sure. Try me. I'm a good person, I'm telling you. I've never murdered anybody. How many people, just out of curiosity, how many people have murdered somebody? No, don't. You know, you know what Jesus says? You even look at another person with hatred in your eye, you've committed murder in your heart. How many people ever committed murder? Oh, my goodness. 
bunch of murder, murdering, lying, thieving, and, and you're a good person. I'd like to meet a bad person. Wow. The need for Jesus is universal. Everybody, everywhere needs Jesus Christ. An Israelite needs Jesus, so does a Gentile. Everyone needs Jesus. The good news about Jesus is that he's a universal message. He's universal. He's for everybody. No matter who the person is, no matter what language they speak, no matter where they call home, it doesn't matter. We all need Jesus Christ. After Jesus dies and rises again, he sends his disciples to every nation. He says, go into every nation. He sends his disciples to every tongue, every nation, every tribe. They've gone, from, they've gone from the Middle East, from the Roman Empire, through Africa, through Europe, and over here to the, to the first world. We're so proud of ourselves. We're now the third world, I think. The need for Jesus is not just universal, it's personal. It's personal. Jesus could have appeared on Samaritan television, but he didn't. He could have written a book and placed it in every bookstore in Samaria, but he didn't. He could have held a huge evangelistic meeting in, in Samaria's capital city, but he didn't. He went out of his way to find this woman who was at a well. He personally met with her. And gave her the good news. Jesus is after our heart. He's after our worship. Jesus wants us to have joy. He loves us. He wants us to make us. He wants to make us whole. Because we're all broken. We're all full of sin. We're broken. And whether we're religious. Or whether we're an atheist. Whether we're moral or immoral. It doesn't matter what we are. Who we are. Where we came from. We all need Jesus and we need him in a personal way. We don't need him in a church way. We need him in a personal way. We often act as if the good news about Jesus can be shared through big programs and events. It's nice that you all come here and I can share Jesus with you. That's really nice. But I'm not the person who's going to lead you to Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to meet with you personally. The Holy Spirit of God is going to speak to your heart. The Holy Spirit is going to convict you of your sin, not me. The Holy Spirit's going to do that work, and he's going to draw you to God. I'm just giving you some information to help clarify anything the Holy Spirit might be telling you. This is, this is not what I do. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He meets with you personally. Jesus went... To an everyday place. He went to a well. And he found a woman who needed him. And he told her the good news. So you got to ask yourself. Where's your well? Where's your well? Maybe you need to go to the cafeteria. At your work. And you need to find somebody to talk to. And share Jesus Christ with personally. Maybe you need to. Lean over the fence of your backyard. Like, like Wilson on Home Improvements. And you need to talk just to, hey, neighbor, howdy how, neighbor. Yeah. You, you, maybe that's what you got to do. Maybe you need to sit by someone at a sporting event and share Jesus with that person. The good news isn't spread group to group. It's spread by person, person to person. That's how it's spread. If, if you guys aren't sharing Jesus with people that you know and people you bump into, then they're not going to come to know the Lord. They can go to church all they want. But it's when you plant seeds and the Holy Spirit waters those seeds and grows those seeds. Every person you see shares the same need, and that's a need for Jesus Christ. The woman heard about Jesus. Jesus spoke to her. She understood what he was saying. She ran into town and she told all of her friends and family about Jesus. And you know what happened? Many of them, it says, many of them went to meet Jesus. Many of them. Because that woman took the time. Would they have gone if, if she hadn't have done that? The world is full of people who need Jesus. 
People who don't have Jesus Christ are dying. They're dying and it's going to be an everlasting death because they don't have everlasting life. Maybe they haven't heard about it. Maybe, maybe they choose it. God doesn't send anybody to hell. If people end up there, it's because they chose to go there or they chose to reject Jesus Christ, which is the same thing. We need to talk to people. And I'll tell you something. Georgina is so right right now. People want to hear. I think people are starting to understand there's a need. They're confused. They're being lied to by everybody. They're being ripped off by every People are, are they're down, man. They're down. If that don't break your heart, you've got some information they need. You need to share that with them. If you're born again, if, if the Holy Spirit of God lives in you, you should be listening to this and going, I got to get busy. I got to go and talk to my friends. If I went to your work, if I went to your place of work, could I talk to the people that work with you and say, is that person a born again Christian? Would they know what I was talking about? They say, I don't know, a person never told me. Is that what would happen? Or would everybody at your work go, oh yeah, Steve Hanna? He's living his life for Jesus Christ. That's a good way of figuring it out. Man, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much. Hey, wait, let me get you all to stand up. Because you've been sitting so long, sorry. I know, I get the thrombosis. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for the work of your Holy Spirit. The way your Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, helps guide us in the life that we're to live. Oh, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that God lives in us. Those of us who are born again, who have received you as Lord and Savior. What a beautiful thing. God, I know there's some here today who don't know you. Maybe personally, they don't know you. They know of you. They've heard of you. But they don't know you. They haven't had a relationship with you. I pray in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would speak to them right now. God, open their minds and open their hearts to hear the word of God. To know the truth. Because the truth will set them free. Father, there's people here that are hurting. They're hurting because of relationships they're in. They're hurting because of people around them are hurting them. They're hurting because of, of all the lies, all the confusion in our society. God, I pray for these people in Jesus' name. Touch them right now with your Holy Spirit. Work in their hearts, God. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, Maybe you did follow him at one time and you've walked away. Maybe you're not following him the way you should be and you know it because the Holy Spirit's telling you. Maybe you've never known Jesus Christ. And you want to know Jesus Christ. You want him in your life. You want him there to help you through all the trials of life. But you also want him there because he's going to give you joy and peace that you don't even understand. Jesus wants to give you eternal life. He wants to give you, he's a fountain of living water. And he wants you never to be thirsty again. Spiritually thirsty. If Jesus is talking to you this morning, I want you to just come up to the front here so that we can pray for you. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to give us money. You don't have to become a member. I just want you to come forward so we can pray for you. That's all. And if, as you come forward, what you're saying to God is you're saying, I know that I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I need a rescuer. I need Jesus Christ. I need his joy. I need his forgiveness. I need his love. Don't put this off. Come forward. If you're, if you're afraid, I get it. Just grab the hand of the person next to you and say, come forward with me. I'm a little nervous. Jesus is talking to you right now. Don't put it off. This is, this is the God of the universe is taking time to spend with you. He wants to talk to you. He wants to save you from your sin. He wants to give you the hope of eternal life. After this life, 
We move into a new life. God's talking to you. Come quickly. Don't put it off because Satan will convince you, man. Procrastination, you'll put it off. Is Jesus talking to you? else here. Come quickly. <clears throat> Don't fight God, man. You're going to lose. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Father, we thank you so much for everybody that's here this morning. I pray, God, those that you're talking to, you continue to speak to today. God, we we pray for their salvation. We want them to be rescued, Lord. Not, not for our sake, but because we know it pleases you. And we thank you so much for this, Lord. Thank you for Brandon. Thank you for your Holy Spirit living in his heart. Right now. Right now. We thank you for that, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Protect him from the evil one. Surround him with people that can encourage him in his walk with you. We thank you so much. Thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your love. You're such a great God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
returning Savior. God bless everyone. Have a great morning. You're all welcome to uh, come back at 12 for a little baby shower and just say hi to Ryan and Sarah um, downstairs. So God bless. Have a great day. We'll see you soon.